Welcome to the first video on pre-design and formal thinking with Formit. And this first video is basically going to get us some of our site data, some of our contextual data. And we are going to grab that from Flux. We are going to use Revit as a means to push that data then from Revit into Formit. So we can begin working with Formit, uh, doing some abstract design thinking, some formal design thinking on our project. So let's just dive right into it. So right now on the screen is the Flux website. And if you're not too familiar with Flux, this is super simple, super easy to use, and it generates really, really good data for us. So this is something I've turned my architectural students onto, and we've been using it extensively for the belt last six months to a year now. So essentially, I've got a, an, an address that I've typed in, uh, which is 19th and Main in Kansas City, Missouri. I've got a bounding box. And on my right, I have the data that I want to import or extract from this location. One thing that the students kind of like to use, which is a little unnerving at times for me, but can be okay depending on the type of site you're working on, is randomly generate building heights where data is unavailable. So in a location like this in downtown Kansas City, I have building footprints, and that's going to show up really clearly, but I do not have building heights. If I turn this on, this is going to generate solid models for me, but it's not going to give them a specific height. It's just going to give them a random height. And in a case like the project that I have students working on that I'm going to share this sort of site and project with over this next set of videos, we are doing a building directly adjacent to an existing building. And so I really don't want that. I, I need to take very precise control over those building heights because that context matters. I suppose there's some cases where it might not and you just need the building heights, but be aware that that is a random number. It is not an accurate number at all. So that can be a little bit deceiving. So from here, once I have what I want, what data that I would like to export, I simply go to select project and it's going to build this project for me that I can view then um, again in Flex, uh, in Flux, excuse me. And this is called the, the Data Explorer version of Flux. And you can see the type of information that this is going to provide for me. So I have roads, building outlines, and a mesh that is going to represent the topography. Pretty simple to do. From there, there is a Flux importer and exporter inside of Revit. And if you notice, there's an exporter as well. If I'm doing things in Revit, I can actually start pushing that data back up to Flux as well. That's a different set of videos, though. We're not going to cover that one today. So my next step is simply to go over to Revit. And once we're in Revit, I'm going to go to the Flux add-in. And if you note, um, in the handout, there is a link to download the Flux plugin. But it's a pretty simple thing to use. I'm just going to go to Receive, Project Name. It's going to go online and search for my projects. So this is Kansas City Research Projects. I'm going to start with the topography, the topographic mesh, and say Receive. From there, it's going to ask me what category. And I can select generic models, but then I'll have a little bit of additional work that I need to do. If I go ahead and call that topography, Revit is going to assume it's topography right from the very beginning. So I've got that selected. I'm going to click Merge. And I always remind, especially students, that you are in a 3D world. So I'm viewing a cut plane, a section plane, looking down at my site view. Let's flip over to my project browser, actually in level one view, in my site view, looking down, and I do not have the mesh anywhere in this view. And that's simply because it's actually located several hundred feet high uh, and up and to the right a little bit. So that's one of the first things that we'll need to take care of once I have all of my data in place. So let's go to a 3D view, and now I can see that. And if you can't see it, a lot of times, right-click, zoom to fit, and that's going to bring it front and center. So you can see that came in as an editable topographic surface inside of Revit, which is excellent. I mean, that's super easy process. If you have a mesh that doesn't come in that way or doesn't come in that easily, uh, in your handout there is an additional set of steps that, that will guide you through turning this into a mesh. Uh, but that's something in this particular case we don't have to do, which is fabulous. Less work. It's always a good thing. So let's go back to my Flux plugin 
and I'm going to go to receive and let's go ahead and grab the roads and merge and not worry too much about the warning here um, it's just an off-axis warning um, that's almost always going to happen uh, and if you notice I can use this panel right here or my flux connection right here I can also come down and say add from this location same, similar step so I've brought in the roads and if you notice the roads I get a center line for the roads I'm not getting the edges but we'll work through that roads center line building footprints and merge and those are the three pieces of data that are relevant to this specific location there's some a little bit of additional data on parks a few things like that but nothing that is really imperative that I bring in that's going to show me a lot about the site the site I'm actually working on is this guy right here and if you notice how some of these lines are cut off really simple fix when we need that especially like right here just switching that to wireframe we should be able to see everything clearly that's just an issue of when these uh, model lines are crossing underneath the topography so my next step is actually to move all of this data closer to the origin if this is my building site I know Revit Formit, most 3d programs that are building centric are really going to perform best if your site your building site is close to or at the origin and so that's really the next step that I want to go through and make all of that stuff working uh, just perfectly for me so let's go ahead and do a bounding box around everything and I'm going to group it together and I'm going to name that group site pretty simple I'm going to start in my elevation view so I'm going to go back to the project browser and go to one of my elevation views and I'm simply going to use this elevation view to pull the site down and get it close and this part of the process is really definitely more of an art than a science um, I don't know exactly how my building is going to work I don't know exactly its elevation but if I can get it close I have a much better starting point um, than working at a much much higher area oh wow I haven't done that one before let's do a quick undo here see if I can do a little better job of moving it this time make that a two-step process I think I sent it all the way off the screen okay so I'm basically doing a drag and drop on the moves and if I go to my site view now it's going to take a little bit of time to build that site view again because there should be geometry in my view now and I'm going to use the same technique to move the site right here to the origin point so I'm just going to drag that over and one more time slide that into place And this is, you know, moving quite a bit of data around. So this can be a little bit fickle. So it just takes a few times kind of bumping this around. Um, and, I, you know, I'll also use the arrow keys to get things right where I want them. Or at least very close to it. Because this is not one of those functions in this particular point that gives you just perfect perfect control because some of these lines are locked the topo surface can be locked but I can get it very very close so from this point there's a few things that I want to do I'm going to go ahead and cut a section all the way through this centered through the site and what that's going to allow me to do is sort of finalize that vertical location of the topography so that my site 
is close to zero, zero. That way my entry level also ideally will line up at zero, zero as well. And granted, as the project moves forward, I'm of course going to have to make some modifications to that. But if I can start at least in the ballpark, things are going to move a lot easier. So you can see the section, things are a little bit too low right now. And again, I'm just going to drag that piece up and get that base of the topography at my site really close to level zero. Let's see if I can just bump that down just a little bit more. So I'm just using the arrow key to nudge that down so that we're right at zero. If I go back to my site, you can see I have my topo lines coming through. I'm going to do a quick label. So let's go to Mask and Site, Label Contours, just to verify. And so you can see this topo line that's coming through right at the middle of my site is right at zero. So I know I'm in, a, I'm in pretty good shape right now. So the last thing I'm going to do is underneath Masking and Site, I want these topo lines to export to form it for me. But given the density of the lines, especially in some of the locations, uh, as you can see, topography really does matter on this project. Uh, this location of Kansas City is quite hilly. Uh, there are, and there are times where I might not need to do this step at all. We're using a perfectly flat site is fine. But in a location, most of our locations in the Midwest, for that matter, topography matters a great deal. We've got about three feet, four feet of fall from one edge of the building to the other. And that's relevant in terms of entry heights. So it's something that I want to be working with. But... I've got a few too many lines. So underneath model site, I'm just gonna click on this down arrow. Let's change our increment. This is how often we're drawing a topography line to 10 feet. So it's going to reduce the number of topo lines. This is just something you have to lock in your memory. When I get this informant, I'll be able to see these lines, but I have to remember they're not representing every one foot, they're representing every 10 feet. So it's a lot easier for me to manage that in terms of line work data coming in. I can delete this temporary section. Don't need that guy anymore. The last thing I want to do is crop this using the section box tool for a couple of reasons. So let's go back to our 3D view. And in my view properties, I'm going to turn on the section box. So with the section box, I'm simply going to squeeze this in quite a bit, eliminate some of the extra lines on the edges, and it's going to give me one more really important piece of this as a 3D model, and that is it's going to build edges for me. Those edges are going to be the basis of starting a 3D model that I can use the CNC router to cut, or I can use the 3D printer to print out. So let's pull that in just a little bit more. Again, knowing my building site is right here. And I'm going to use this section box to actually pull down and increase those sides. So these are actually surfaces now. If I zoom in on them, um, you'll actually see that there is a surface built there, which Revit uses to put the earth hatch pattern on. So from here, I am ready to save my Revit file. And once that Revit file is saved, I'm ready to export it as a DWG, which we can import into Format. So let's do File, Export. DWG. Next, so I'm naming it step one, project site. We'll replace that file. And then we'll switch to format. Inside of format, so this is not the web version of format. This is the version that lives on your desktop. I'm simply going to go file, import geometry, import 3D model, and select my DWG file and say open. And there you have it. I've got a one-to-one -one topography directly inside of Formit now with my site close to the origin. One little weird thing that happens, you notice how this is sort of cropping off, and that's really a simple fix that I can have turned on and off as needed. And that is um, the ground plane. So underneath visual styles on your grid, just turning on and off the ground plane will take care of that. We'll do a few things in terms of adding material to this so that it's workable, and then also turning this into a watertight model 
as you can see, it's sort of a hollow object right now. We'll turn that into a watertight model so we can use a 3D printer on it in the next video.